All right, guys, welcome back to Strong Successful Mail. So for today, I'm going to go over this great email that was sent from a subscriber. That's from a guy, I believe, off the top of my head, he's in his 50s, and he shares his story, a story that's actually a prequel to a video I did a few weeks ago, which was titled, My Post-Divorce post -divorce Girlfriend Played Mind Games With Me, So I Played The Ultimate Mental Gymnastics With Her. Now that story was about how after his divorce, his first girlfriend he dated was a nut job, and how he had fun with her and all that you all recall. But in that story, he mentioned about his divorce and how he got full custody of his son because she was nuts. And I mentioned, and a lot of you guys mentioned in the comments, you wanted to hear that story. So he's writing in about that story with his divorce. And let me tell you guys, this is a story where this guy does, he makes a lot of mistakes where he, there were red flags about her, but he still married her anyway, which was a boneheaded move. As no surprise, she her crazy ways came out and led to her put a restraining order against him, and all these awful things happened to him, and this guy went through hell. However, you're going to see as he goes through a whole lot of hell, our guy handles things right, and he finds his strength, gets a good lawyer, and let me tell you, turns things around, and he comes back on top. And that'd be a great one to go over here, guys, to show you, number one, as I say all the time, don't get involved with crazy. I don't care how hot they are, how great their body is, how freaky they are in bed. And that's definitely a big thing that ropes us all in. Don't let it happen. Don't do that. As well as getting involved with single MOMs and things like that. You have to look out for the red flags. And if they're uh, bright and in front of you, run for the hills. It's not worth it no matter how good looking or hot she is or what you can get out of her. And also, guys, how a guy can go through pure hell. And eventually, when he goes through the emotions, he can find strength where he never knew he had it. And with the right people and the right help, justice can be served. And it's a great one here. And let me tell you, justice will be served here. So for you guys that enjoy a good comeback story to give you hope, to give you entertainment, you'll definitely enjoy this one. So grab a beer. It's a good one. He says, uh, Dear SSM, I am the guy that sent the email regarding the mental gymnastics that I did with my crazy post-divorce girlfriend after I had enough of her BS. I know that during your video, you asked a couple of questions about what happened with my ex-wife and if I knew about her mental issues when I married her. So I thought I would give you my story, greatly shortened of course from what it was before, and to tell you about how me and my friend of mine got some payback on my crazy ex-wife with the use of eBay. Although most of the credit for the payback goes to my friend, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We love great payback stories on this channel. And again, as I said before, this is a story where a guy, he, he's down and out for a bit. And then he has his rise. And then she's down and out. Where things should be when someone does you wrong. I married my ex-wife, whom I will refer to as Cindy, in the early 1990s. And we married about nine months after we met. Nine months after you met? Smack! Why? Why on God's green earth would you do something so crazy? You barely know each other. You gotta be nuts. But then again, well... She was nut, or is nuts, so at least one of you is nuts, officially. Never do that, guys. This was in spite of several red flags, which I had repeatedly smacked myself over the years for ignoring. Yeah, probably the uh, poontang was good. That was probably the issue there. She was a single MOM with two girls when we started dating. Holy fucking shit. Smack. Now I know why she rushed into the marriage. She found herself a provider. That's how it works. God's sakes. The girls were in the care of Cindy's parents because she couldn't take care of them. She had issues holding a job for any length of time, and she had issues with mental health in the past, including thinking about offing herself. Single MO, two girls. Can't take care of them because she's not responsible enough. Can't hold down a job. And mental issues, thinking about offing herself. Yeah, this, she's a catch. Like I said, lots of smacks for my younger self. Yes, for your younger self, not you now. I was in love and wasn't thinking well. But that's what the indiscretions and idiocy of youth will do. Yes, I've been a young dumbass myself. And many people probably who hate me say I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an older dumbass now. But we all make mistakes. I was married to Cindy for 10 years. And during that time, we were mostly happy. With my influence... Her mental issues were mostly kept at bay, and I proved to be the stabilizing influence on her. During this time, I worked hard as an airman in the Air Force, and also went back to school, graduating with honors and my degree in computer science while I was on active duty airman. 
So you got married in the military, which I tell you all not to do. Smack! Damn it. While I was in, we succeeded in getting custody of my wife's daughters, and my wife became pregnant with our son, who I will call Michael. No, I'm not going to be one of those people that say we got pregnant. Well, thank God, it's about freaking time. After seven years, I left the Air Force and started working nights in a computer operations center for the extra money that I got by working, the sh by working shift work. It was during that last year of our marriage that things fell apart. Both girls would eventually end up going back to live with their grandparents because of the mental issues, issues inherited from their mother and biological father. And it was eventually just my wife, my son, and I living together. Cindy's parents were both teachers with experience helping kids with special needs. Well, thank God for that. One morning, I had once I had once more once more worked an overnight shift, and as I returned home, I couldn't find Cindy or Michael anywhere. I tried calling Cindy's cell phone, but it just went straight to our landline. We had it set up so that if we didn't pick up, it transferred to our landlines landlines automatically. I tried calling several friends of ours while looking for my wife and and son, and none of them knew where they were, but would tell me if they learned something. So, I would be having a heart attack over that. Your wife's gone. You can't find your son. Her history of mental illness, thinking about offing herself. You all can connect the dots with an unstable person, man or woman, with those issues and taking a young child. Good God. Uh, the only thing that was really strange was that when I tried calling two of our friends named Larry and Susan, they never picked up their phone. But when I tried calling Cindy's parents, they wouldn't pick up either. As you can imagine, I was going out of my mind. I didn't know if something had happened to them or where they could be. My world was spinning out of control. In desperation, I started driving around the city, hoping to find out something. I did this all day, having called off from my second job because of my family emergency. It wasn't until later in the afternoon that I went and called the cops. That I was informed that they were there was a restraining order in place against me. You gotta be shitting me. You're the stable one in this whole situation. The restraining order's against you. This is why you don't marry crazy. You don't even get anywhere near crazy, guys. Keep your D out of crazy. I remember meekly replying, thank you, as I tried to comprehend what just happened. Not gonna lie, I started crying. Dude, there's no shame. Your whole world's going upside down here. Just don't cry in front of her. Uh, uncontrollable fits of crying that I had never had before and, and would never have again. For those of you that don't know, in my state, you don't need any proof to get a temporary restraining order placed against you. All you need is for someone to say that they are in fear for their safety and one is granted. <laughs> Eventually, I ended up calling the only woman in the world that I knew I could trust, my mother. That's pretty much about it, guys, in life of who you can truly trust. And even then, as you are aware, that's not always the case. But if there's one woman you can most of the time have your back, it's your mama. Not all the time, but hopefully most cases. She heard me crying as I tried to explain. She said she would call me back in just a few minutes. Once she did, she told me that she had called Cindy's parents, who told her that out of respect, they are not talking to anyone on my side of the family, and that is all they would say. I then called another friend of mine, Tim. I told him that Cindy had issued a restraining order against me, and I needed someone to stay with me tonight. I told him I was afraid of what I might do. Within 30 minutes, he was at my house with a sleeping bag. I couldn't, sleep, I couldn't even sleep in my bed, instead sleeping on the couch while he slept on the floor next to me. I remember waking up throughout the night, still unable to comprehend the horror that I was living. Dude, that is terrible. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And Tim is a good, loyal friend. Never forget never forget what he did for you. The next morning, I went to the courthouse where I could go and be officially served with their restraining order. I'm sure that was pleasant. Tim had the good sense to grab my collection of old books, something that was precious to me, and my laptop and put them in his truck before we went to the courthouse. Once there, I was served with the restraining order. As I read through the order, I saw my wife's handwriting that started by detail every minor incident that she could imagine, exaggerating minor disagreements, telling half-truths, and sometimes outright lies. I just kept sobbing in the courthouse. 
After everything you did for her, marrying a single MOM with two kids, her history, all these things, and this is how she repays you. Not to mention you're busting your ass on your job, <clears throat> working overtime, extra job, all these things to provide a nice life, and this is the thanks you get. How many guys watching this have been divorced and been through something in some way or known someone like this, and people wonder why guys don't get married anymore? Eventually, I got to the end of the document where it told me I need to contact the police to have an officer escort me into my home to collect some clothing and toiletries. I still remember trying to hold together as the policeman watched me pack up several of my clothes. I was in such a state of disarray that I didn't even bother to grab a suitcase. Just a garbage bag to put my clothes in. I was a mess. In your own home, which you're paying for and providing, and you got to leave your own home with a cop there to watch you, who probably no doubt is already has a bias that you're the villain here. I know a lot of you guys are pretty pissed at this point, but don't worry, justice will be served. Uh, Tim told me that he would let me stay in his spare room in the single wide that he owned. It wasn't much, but it was, it was shelter and it had a bed in it. When we got there, I collapsed into the bed from sheer exhaustion. Not sure what I would do next. That morning, my sister called me to tell me she was flying out. I happened to live in an area where most of my mother's family lived, her being the exception. She told me that she would meet me at my grandfather's house the next evening with one of my aunts that lived locally. My mother lived in another state, but I was fortunate to have two aunts and my grandfather that lived close to me. I told them I would be there. I spent the next evening in a state of exhaustion as I tried to sleep, only to wake up to start crying, only to fall back asleep from exhaustion. Man, you poor bastard. I'm sorry you went, what you went through. And worse yet, you can't talk to your kid. Unless I'm missing something here. And I guarantee your son is like, where's daddy? Where's daddy? The next day... I went to work and made, um, by the way, a, a shout out to your sister for being so great for you. The next day I went to my work and made changes so that my paycheck would not be deposited into my joint account and I created my own bank account. Very smart, bro. I also talked to my boss and explained the situation to him between fits of crying. I told him that I needed to get 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 off of the night shifts to, to some normal ones. I explained there was a good possibility I would be a single father before long and I need to make changes to accommodate that. He told me that he would look into what he could do. Dude, that was very smart talking to your boss and to get on a stable schedule. And that way then, when eventually, with the help of a good attorney, you can obviously hope to get your partial custody of your son or maybe one day full custody of your son, you can show that you're on a stable schedule. So very smart. I collected myself, I collected myself together enough to drive over to my grandfather's home. I was greeted by my mother's, my mother and my aunt. They both hugged me and told me how sorry they were as we talked about what to do next. I still remember my aunt asking me if I wanted a beer. I looked at her and I said with a weak smile, the closest I had come to a smile in the last couple days. I never understand why people who are depressed think it's a good idea to drink a depressant. I agree with you, ma'am. Uh, she laughed at my response and made a comment about how sensible I always were, always was. We all sat down trying to figure out what to do next, and I told them that I guessed I would have to get a lawyer for whatever was going to happen next. I didn't know anything about lawyers or how I would find a good one. Then my aunt piped up and said she would ask my other aunt about her lawyer. She's been divorced twice, and she screwed both of her husbands. So, you have an aunt who is proven to be an a-hole in her marriages. Divorced twice and screw both of her husbands. However, if you can use her evil on your side to get justice for you, so be it. And not to mention her shark of an attorney. In spite of myself, I laughed for the first time since this whole thing started. We called my other aunt and she gave me the number of her lawyer. I called her office and scheduled an appointment the next day. So it's a female attorney here. I'm noticing a pattern, gentlemen, that a lot of these guys that lives go to shit, they end up hiring a female attorney and in a way fighting fire with fire and it works out very much in their favor. I know some female attorneys and they are fucking sharks. <laughs> Whew. My mother then told me she would uh, take my clothes, my clothes, would take my clothes shopping to get me a nice outfit for my lawyer and for court since I would be needing it. For once in my life, I didn't object to my mother taking me clothing shopping. She bought me a couple nice sets of slacks, a button-down shirt with ties, and a sports coat. I hadn't collected all my clothes, and I knew I would need them. 
I then went back to Tim's with the knowledge I would meet with my mother the next morning. Good. You got a support group that has your back, brother, friends, family. You got a recommendation for a good, experienced shark of an attorney. And you got them helping you when you're down. This is awesome. That night, as I laid in bed, I continued to think about everything that was going on. I always known that when something bad happens, it's best to tackle it head on and work the problem. For the last several days, I've been an emotional wreck. My whole world was gone. As I lay in bed, I started to get mad. I came out, I came out of my room the next morning. I saw Tim sitting on the table eating breakfast cereal. I told him, okay, I'm in World War II. I'm in America. Cindy is Japan. And Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor has just happened. She might have won the battle, but I'm ready to win the war. Yes, now you're in the fighting mode. You've gone through the depression and the hurt. Now you're fucking pissed and you're ready for battle. Good. And off you go to your lawyer's office. I saw Tim smile at me and say, You know, John, I've seen other guys that have gone, have had the rugs torn out, torn out from under them. Not quite as bad as you've had it, but I've seen it. I've also never seen anyone turn around and be ready to fight so quickly. I just kind of shook. I just kind of shook my head and said, "I'm done feeling sorry for myself. I can take control of my life, or someone else will take control of it. I know which one I want." Bravo, man! Exactly, exactly, guys. I love that attitude. So I picked up my mom from my grandfather's, and we went to where the lawyer's office was. I remember how we arrived in the area about 45 minutes early, so we went to a village in restaurant to get something to eat. I remember having a cup of chicken soup. With the first food I'd eaten in the last three days. During those three days, I had forced myself to drink water, but I knew during that, that time that I couldn't keep any food down because my insides were all tied up in knots. Finally, we were in talking to my lawyer. We talked for a good two hours as I explained everything. I won't go into all the details about what was said, but, I, but with uh, hindsight, the three most important points that she covered with me. First, we live in a no-fault divorce state. Which meant that Cindy was cheat. If Cindy was cheating, it wouldn't be a factor in the divorce. That is madness. That was disappointing since I strongly suspected that she was sleeping with Larry. I guarantee you, she's effing somebody. The two of them had grown very close over the last year. The second important point was when I told my lawyer, "I don't care about the money or anything like that. I want my son. I can always make more money, but I don't want my son to be raised by that psycho." The third thing I told her was, I know my wife. It's good you know, know your enemy. And yes, you can always make more money. You're a hard worker. You got a bright future. But of course, we'd like to keep our money. Over the course of, the, of our divorce, I can guarantee the following things will happen. Number one, Larry and Susan, the two friends who wouldn't pick up and most assuredly help Cindy with the restraining order, who were also jobless and living on welfare in a tiny apartment with three kids and a fourth on the way, will move in with her if they haven't already done so. Remember what I say, guys, about paying attention to who your girl, who her friends are? Look at these losers that he's talking about here. They're rubbing off on her. Uh, number two. I give 50-50 odds as to whether my wife will be pregnant or not at the end of the divorce. Not because she won't sleep with someone else, but because I just don't know if she will get pregnant. Number three, my wife will stop working. She will she will cite emotional exhaustion or depression or something like that. Number four, Larry and Susan will move out because they won't get tired of Cindy's BS. And number five, Cindy will, will make a uh, an attempt to off herself. My wife has not done any of these things while we've been married because I've been a stabilizing influence in her life. Without me, these things will happen. Okay, so we're going to see, guys, if all this, what he described to you, will happen. Remember, he knows his... Well, let's just say he thought he knew his wife pretty well. I mean, I gotta, I gotta be curious. I'm curious about something. If the guy writing in the story now is honest, looking back, is he all that surprised at what happened? I mean, he was blindsided in that this moment. But looking back, and now that he, his life is so great and all that, is he all that surprised what happened given all the red flags he ignored with her in the beginning? I'm probably going to say, he. I'm guessing he'll probably say he wasn't surprised. I could tell my new lawyer didn't think all those things would happen, but she told me she would take the case. My mother paid for her retainer, and my attorney filed the paperwork to be served to Cindy as soon as possible. 
She also stated that if I truly believe that she was not in a good mental state, then she wanted to have a psychological evaluation done on both me and my wife to figure out what sort of custody arrangement would be in the best interest of the child. If Cindy was as crazy as I believed, there'd be a good chance I would get at least partial custody of my son. Well, the bee is definitely crazy, so the odds are in your favor. I remember as we talked with her, she finally asked the one question that I wasn't prepared for. Is there any chance that you will want to reconcile? <laughs> I would, I'd be like, I would rather reconcile with Hannibal Lecter than this crazy bee. I thought about it for a moment and I realized how difficult the question was for me. But after a moment, I shook my head and told her no. If we were to reconcile, the next time that she decided she was upset about something, she would do it again. No sense of wasting effort in if we would, won't get anything positive out of it. The paperwork was filed, and I was given a checklist of things to accomplish. Great. After my visit with a lawyer, one of my friends reached out to me. Her name was Julie, and she shared our love of science fiction. She also had been divorced from a cheating husband, and I always thought of her as a good friend to both Cindy and myself. I made the journey to Julie's house, and she immediately hugged me and made me some tea. I sat down and went through the whole story about the restraining order and everything. She knew the kind of people we were, and she told me another bombshell. Cindy swore me to secrecy on this. Oh, great. What did Cindy swear you to secrecy on? She, hated to keep this, she said, I hate to keep this from you, but I can't believe that she did this to you. Cindy has been sleeping with Larry behind yours and Susan's back. Shocker. She's cheating on him. But this girl, Julie, who's his so-called friend, has known that she's been cheating on him. I got a major fucking problem with this. I could see the tears welling up in her eyes as she explained. I'm sorry I didn't tell you, she said. I wanted to, but I was sworn to secrecy. I have a major problem with this, and of course she could do the waterworks. I just kind of looked at her, and I don't know if she thought I would explode in rage. Instead, I just nodded and said, I'm not surprised, and I don't blame you. Cindy put you in a place where you had to choose between doing what you thought was right and breaking your confidence. Well, here's I have an issue with this. Why keep your confidence and your word to someone that's a piece of shit? She obviously knows this dude telling the story is a good guy. And that, and Cindy is a freaking liar and manipulator and cheater and is dis, a disgusting person. So when it comes to that, I feel, in my opinion, I, know, I owe no allegiance to someone like that. She should have told you. But the past is the past. She reached over and hugged me and said, I'm so sorry, John. You deserve better than this. I wonder if she was thinking of you. <laughs> that bitch took things to a new low, especially with her restraining order. You've never been anything but a good man to her and your kids. When she said that, at this point, I realized that the betrayal was even deeper than I had known. I suspected, but the confirmation, the confirmation of it crushed me because of all my worst fears became realized. Well, I don't think anybody listening to this story is at all surprised that she was hooking up with some other dude. It was a couple weeks later that I appeared for the restraining order hearing. Cindy was there along with some man who I would later learn was her lawyer. My lawyer was there with me and she addressed the judge. Her attorney began by muttering something about me completing, completing anger management to allow for the restraining order to be lifted. My lawyer responded by saying that we had no intention of asking for the restraining order to be lifted. Instead, we asked it to be changed to a no-contact order and that the only contact I'd be allowed was to pick up my son and that would be allowed and that would be allowed for divorce proceedings to move forward. Well, they weren't expecting that. When her lawyer objected that I had an unstable schedule that would not be con conducive to the child's well-being, my lawyer immediately corrected him, telling him, my client has been moved to a new position in his company. He is currently working normal business hours, and we expect that shared custody will be enforced immediately starting tomorrow, with my client having three days with his son in, in one week and four days in the alternate. It was amusing when Cindy looked at me and said, since when do you have normal working hours? Only to have my attorney address the court and say, Your Honor, the respondent should address my client while there's a restraining order or no contact order in place. <laughs> so this goes back to when you forced yourself to talk to your boss and say, Boss, I need a different schedule because this is going to come into play and so good for you right here. This really helped you. And you did that without the advice of your attorney. It was the first minor battle where my wife was put in her place by my attorney. 
but I have to admit, it felt incredibly satisfying. Cindy had this look on her face like she knew I wasn't messing around. So guys, that is going to wrap up part one. We've had... Stop yelling at me. Part one, things are going down to hell in a handbasket. Part two is when our guy here is making his comeback. And oh, he's going to get things right in his life. And her life is going to go to complete dog crap. So I keep my word always. So in a couple hours, tune back in. And we're going to hear part two of this story. Because I'm not going to do all this because it's too freaking long. And I've noticed people tend to respond better to shorter stories broken into two as opposed to 50-minute things. So guys... Uh, go uh, do what you got to do and uh, come back in a couple hours and you'll see the continuation of this guy's story where justice is served. See you then.